Hello, everyone, and welcome to day 49 of Bitwise, where we design a, uh, <laughs> a, a, a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. I almost forgot the tagline. Uh, today, we move on to uh, an intro to logic design. So uh, last time, we briefly covered some of the roadmap for the kind of hardware design part of the project, at least the initial phase of that. And uh, today, I want to move to logic design. And again, this is with a sort of software programmer's focus, meaning I assume that I am talking to other people who have programming experience at sort of the systems level, um, but maybe haven't done uh, logic design explicitly or hardware design at all. Um, so that's the focus for today. Now, um, if you've watched any of the uh, five or so DSL streams uh, we did before we formally started uh, the hardware phase, you will know that um, we have been starting to work on a hardware description language in, in Python uh, that, that called Rattle, which is a, a bad pun on RTL, register transfer level. Um, but um, so, so today I'm going to, without necessarily, at least in this initial stream, I'm not really going to be explaining a whole lot about you know, the, the, the innermost details of Rattle. If you saw me do the gradual implementation of, of the um, of the language, you'll already know that stuff, and we'll return to it later. But I want to jump in with uh, with just sort of doing logic design stuff, um, treating the syntax as uh, sort of self-explanatory for the most part, um, and hoping that people's um, you know general programming experience uh, and knowledge of you know basic Boolean algebra and stuff like that will uh, will will let them keep up because I don't want to get too bogged down for this initial stream in you know uh, all all the details, and and the whole thing is, is is designed to be sort of reasonable to just look at. Uh, so hopefully um, that will that will turn out to be true. So um, I mentioned last time that um, for logic design, you know, logic design classically is uh, the way it's often introduced is that it's all about you know, taking these uh, gates that are kind of thought of as discrete components, like you have an AND gate, OR gate, NOT gate, stuff like that. Um, and uh, these correspond, you know, very much to, if you're a programmer, you know, they correspond to uh, to these sorts of operations. Uh, in this case here, you know, if, if you're doing this in, in, in a language like C or Python, this means bitwise AND, where each bit of, of those numbers regarded as bit vectors are combined with the Boolean AND operation and so on, uh, or in this case, and, and this is bit, bitwise not. Um, and, uh, and, and and so that's sort of, the I guess, the very classical perspective on a lot of that uh, logic design stuff is that it's all about building, you know, starting with these simple gates and building more complex systems out of, out of them. Um, and so the stuff we'll be co covering today, and probably in the next several um, in the next several uh, streams, is is kind of that level of stuff. How do you start with some simple operations and build up more complex operations? Um, and uh, the, the the one thing I will uh, note starting out is that the conventional focus on, for example, AND and OR gates is kind of overblown a little bit um, in real sort of in real low-level hardware design. It, well, first off, just from a mathematical perspective, there's a whole lot of, of leeway in how you choose your, your set of primitive gates. Um, for example, muxes are another very good primitive, um, sorry, multiplexers, we'll talk about them in a bit, uh, that, that are uh, very useful uh, and, and can be used to build up universal, um, uh, can, can, can be used up to build, you know, larger, like can be used as a building block in, in addition to or in, uh, as an alternative to some of these. Um, and you probably also maybe know that um, even when AND and OR gates are implemented in silicon, they're often so-called NAND and NOR gates most naturally, meaning the, uh, they're, they're so-called inverting logic devices, meaning the output is the not of what you would expect. So in, in some sense, the real low-level version of an AND and OR gate is really something like this, where the, uh, the output is negated relative to, to what you might expect. And all of these things throw a fly in the wrench. Um, but if you look at a lot of the sort of older style textbooks on logic design, they'll really emphasize the standard non-inverting gates. Um, but but really, that's uh, th that may be appropriate if you're um, 
you know, a, a hobbyist and you're buying like TTL logic chips from Radio Shack and putting them together, or I guess, I mean, back when people built many computers out of discrete logic chips, that's kind of the right building block. Um, but but even in chips, uh, you know, e even if you're using those gates, you're typically using these NOR, NAND and NOR gates rather than AND and OR gates. And also um, other, other things like other more complex gates are often directly designed at the transistor level rather than built out of NAND and NOR gates. So what I want to emphasize is that you have to choose a starting point when you're designing logic, a uh, set of primitives. Um, and if you're doing very low level stuff, the primitive is a transistor and we won't cover that right now. Um, but whatever your set of primitives is, that's you, you have to learn how to design efficiently with them and learn uh, how to use them. Um, and uh, I should also mention that um, once we eventually start doing sort of real physical implementation of some of our logic designs, it's going to be um, on an FPGAs. And um, the point about choice of primitives uh, being kind of variable depending on the setting uh, is uh, really, really especially true with FPGAs because FPGAs, um, I mean, this is an oversimplification, but rather than having, um, you know, as the building block and an OR gates, they have arbitrary lookup tables of some number of input bits as the building block. So for example, any six bit input function, logic function, any an arbitrary function from six bits to one bit is essentially equally uh, equally fast, equally cheap on an FPGA. Uh, so for example, XOR, which even a two input XOR is equally, e equally cheap in terms of area on the chip, in terms of resources taken up as, a, uh, as an AND or NAND, um, but if you're doing like real low-level chip design at the transistor level, things like XOR are quite a bit more expensive and uh, and a bit slower than something like a NAND gate. Um, so I just want to get that out of the way is that even though we'll be using some of the um, we'll be using a particular set of building blocks for now, uh, I want to emphasize that it's not really universal. It really depends on the setting what you want to use as your set of primitives um, and you know. As long as you have a, a so-called universal set of building blocks, uh, you, you can build anything, basically. All right, so initial caveat out of the way. Um, one thing we'll be doing today is I will be writing some code for a simple circuit fragment, and then I will be using a visualization tool that takes uh, our circuit written in Rattle and generates a, a graph that shows the connectivity of the circuit elements and um, give a, essentially gives us a schematic. Um, when when people are normally taught logic design, you know the old school way of doing it is to draw these graphical diagrams that show how the different gates are connected and so on. And uh, we'll be using a textual programming language, um, and so we won't that won't be available to us. Uh, although in theory you could build a graphical front end that that lets you do that sort of the schematic layout. Um, but instead we'll be writing stuff in you know in code. And then we'll be, in order to maybe help people make the connection to schematics they've seen uh, in, in books or elsewhere, um, we'll use this tool to generate those diagrams. Um, so, so let me show you simple cases of that. Um, so um, let's define a module. And a module in Rattle is a, um, a reusable sub-circuit. You can define a circuit with a set of input uh, signals and output signals, which represent values dynamically at runtime when the circuit is being evaluated, uh, and specifies the connectivity between the outputs and the inputs. Um, and ultimately, it specifies a function. It specifies how the outputs depend on the inputs. And so uh, let's take an example here. Um, so you uh, you can actually use either a class or a function definition in Python to specify it, but um, let's use a class definition. So you, you define a class and um, you use this decorator, which is called module, uh, to say that this is a module. And um, say we want to uh, we want to have uh, let's take a very simple case and let's call uh, one of the, let's say uh, x is the single bit input. So this notation is hopefully self-explanatory. This is an input to this module. It has type bit, so it's a single bit wire coming in. And 
y is an output, and we then have to specify an expression that uh, specifies how that output signal is defined. And in this case, we're just going to say y is equal to uh, not x. And so if we uh, execute this, um, we don't get uh, pressing you know, F5 and the debugger to run it. So it generates uh, a graphwiz file, this dot file, based on the circuit diagram. And um, I can now generate a, an SVG file, a gra vector graphics file, that I can see in my browser. So let's see how that looks. So let me just zoom in a little bit. So this is what these diagrams look like in their very simplest example. Um, you have an input signal X, which here is a single bit. And this goes into essentially a gate. And so you can see the name of the gate here is just uh, this uh, tilde, which signifies not. Uh, and then the output is driven to Y, which is an output. And you can see that X is an input because of the orientation of the arrow relative to the wire coming out of it and where it is on the screen, right? Like the inputs are on the left, the outputs are on the right. Um, and so um, you can you can stack these up. Okay. I... Uh, so you can obviously you can also present more complex expression. For example, here we have two knots in a row. Um, and so you can see how they stack up. So um, the basic idea about how you build up circuits um, is you compose them. You have these building blocks, uh, and, and the blocks can be either primitive gates or they can be modules that you've built yourself. And so one of the reasons that this notion of a module is so important is similar to how functions are important in conventional programming languages or maybe classes is a more obvious example. It's the idea that you can define a template that can be instantiated uh, for different um, uh, in different instances. Um, and so you don't have to make a hard distinction between things that are built in versus things that are user defined, right? Like, so things like, uh, you know, maybe the not uh, gate is, is sort of hardwired. It's a provided built in primitive, uh, but um, using modules, you don't have to make, you know, you can build your own not gate out of other primitives if you wanted to, right? Um, and so maybe let me uh, maybe let me show you that in a weird way, um, which also makes the point that it, this is not something you should really do <laughs> in practice, but uh, it shows the point about how you can essentially build your own, you know, depending on what your starting point is, you can build um, you can uh, you know you you can you can build your own replacements for built-in primitives. Um, and so what we're going to do here is we're going to um, we're going to XOR. So so here we have this module not, uh, and as before, X is the input, uh, Y is the output, and here we're going to XOR. Uh, you know, it's a single bit, so we're XORing it with one, and XORing with one is the same as flipping the bit. Um, so it's equivalent to a not. No one would ever do this in practice. Although if you want to do a conditional inversion. Uh, that's that's what, um, what one of the things that XOR is good for, but I'm uh, just doing this in order to show that you can build these kind of primitives yourself. Um, and so if you wanted to sort of go back to this thing here, if you wanted to, let me just show what we have here. If you wanted to um, to replace this with your own built-in version of a not uh, of a not device, you could do it as follows. Um, you have to let's see if I get the syntax right. Uh, I can't use, I can't use, I, I have to give a name to the module instance. So I, I have to, in, in my example module, I have to instantiate this, uh, this not module, but uh, I ha and I also have to give it a local name, but I can't give it not, of course, because that's a, a in, in, in Python, that's a reserved word. It means something else. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to instantiate that module not and I use Python's keyword arguments to specify that the, the input uh, signal, the input wire to this uh, instance of the not module should be X. And so the two X's here are 
you know, different. In one case, it's the name of the parameter, uh, which comes from this, and the other case, it's the x from the outside, which comes from this. Um, and then here, um, you can extract the output signal as follows. You use the module instance name dot the output signal if you want to get. I think that should work. Um, and so here you see um, what the notation looks like. You can see it looks different. Oops. Um, it, it obviously looks different from what we had before. Um, but but the, the important point is that from this level of abstraction, you don't know what's inside the, the module. It's just a black box. You can see you feed, you feed its X input and you, uh, you connect its Y output to uh, your Y output. Um, the notation here is uh, on the left, uh, you have, in this case, there's only one input signal, but you have the different input ports. So th that's where you connect the inputs to the module instance. On the right, you have the output ports. Uh, in the middle, you have the name of the module, and this is a universal notation. Anytime, um, anytime a, a module instance or any other sort of uh, logic expression um, is assigned to a variable in the class that defines the module, um, that node gets labeled, and you see the label on top in, a, in this top row here. So, for example, um, if, if we just for a sec, if, if we go back to this. Uh, this thing we had before. Um, so you can see here there's no there's no bar on top of this. Um, but if I um, if I added a temp variable like uh, let's call it not x, and uh, I write it like this, and then this. Um, now you can see we get this. Uh, top row that specifies the uh, the name of the node and this is ma mainly just for human uh, for human consumption these names um, they obviously matter for inputs and outputs because that's how um, that's how the interface of the module is defined you have to know what the names are in order to hook them up to the outside but for these internal uh, internal signals internal uh, sub expressions it's mostly just for uh, for readability in order to label things um, but anyway but yeah, so back to this. Um, this is how you. This is kind of the the reason for uh, for modules existing is that you can define your own uh, building blocks and, and compose them hierarchically, right? So this is uh, in this case here we have a single top level module which is just sort of specifying um, you know our our circuit as a whole. But then you can instantiate you know you can have multiple of these. Um, and in fact, let's let's show that. Let's expand from having uh, probably where um, I'm calling them X and Y is maybe not the most informative. Let's call, um, let's call the inputs Y, you know, for, for, for these kind of symmetric gate-like things. Um, let's call it I and O, input and output. And then let's define our example. And um, let's now say we have, um, say we want to, to do something like this. I'm going to call this O. Um, say we want to do something like this first. Um, so here we just have a uh, an AND gate connected up in a little module here. Uh, and so you can see how these two inputs feed into this and go out. Um, now suppose that we wanted to um, do this instead, so we could, you know, we could either do this directly, um, but we could also instantiate. Um, we could also instantiate uh, two of these. And do it that way. So now you can see rather than using the built-in gate, we're using our own custom version based on XOR. Um, oh, no, we still have the negation. That's obviously not intended. Anyway, so um, hopefully that gives you the basic gist of, of what a module is. Um, 
the typical way these things go is that there's always a top level module which uh, defines just the circuit as a whole that you want to um, to look at so a specific design um, and then uh, below that you typically have a hierarchy of of module instances so in this case it's only a two level hierarchy there's the top level which is example one and then we have these two instances of not and not does not have any sub modules of its own but um, I mean to, to maybe belabor the point um, Say that for some reason we wanted to implement uh, XOR, and now we're really getting into the weeds of stuff that's inefficient, but uh, again, you have the ability to do this. Suppose you wanted to uh, implement your own um, your own XOR uh, module, and you wanted to implement it in terms of, uh, in terms of, well, I guess you need inversion for this, so it becomes a little bit circular, but, um, Anyway, let's do it. So, um, in order for the XOR of I, uh, I1 and I2 to be true, you need uh, I1 to be true and uh, an I2 not to be true, or you need, uh, well, let me put it this way. One, exactly one of them has to be one, equal to one, right? So, th that leaves two possibilities when you have uh, two inputs. Uh, either I1 is one and I2 is zero, or I1 is zero and I, I2 is one. So uh, this is how you could define your own XOR module. Uh, and then you could, um, you could do something like this. So at this point, you know, again, from our point of view, from the top level, we don't really care at this specific level how NOT is implemented. But if we wanted to visualize NOT's internal structure, you could um, you could just do that. And you can see in this case, um, it's instantiating this XOR gate. And then if you go and look at the XOR gate, um, you can, that's the leaf level of the module hierarchy right now. Um, you can see what goes on here. So you can see how there's two AND gates and um, the two inputs occur with opposite polarity in those AND gates, then they're ORed together. So anyway, um, that's, uh, that's the idea behind modules and module hierarchies. And um, this is the sort of thing that, again, uh, I think is maybe underemphasized in traditional logic design. They often start with schematics and uh, stuff like that, um, but this is something that's pretty easy to deal with uh, at this level. Um, but um, Let's, uh, yeah, let's leave that for now, and um, maybe I'll just do a, a new example. Um, okay, this should be an empty design. All right. Um, so um, what we did here, of course, is a simple example of building a more complex uh, logic gate or more complex function, logic function, Boolean function out of, in this case, uh, and, or, and not, which is kind of a classical uh, Boolean algebra problem. Um, and uh, one thing that, I mean, I think this is kind of a classical topic. It might be worth quickly dispensing with, um, but, uh, you know, uh, the one of the first questions that arises is, uh, that of universality. So given, for example, and, or, and not, uh, is it possible to implement any any logic function? So an arbitrary function with some number of input bits and some number of output bits, is it possible to implement that uh, out of these gates? And um, the answer is yes. Um, and instead of doing a mathematical proof in the conventional style, we can actually, uh, quite easily write a, a bit of Python code that takes a uh, either a Python function or a Python table, something that specifies a, uh, a Boolean function and generates the corresponding circuit and uh, using these as primitives. So I think that might be a good way to, to, to demonstrate universality. Um, and so um, 
let me show you what I mean by looking at XOR and how you might come up with this formula if you weren't inspired enough to just see it directly. Um, so let me just, just write it like that. Just turn on my fan. Sorry, it's really warm in here. Um, okay, so how how might you have come up with this formula if you weren't inspired? Um, and, and, and there's a universal re recipe. And I'm going to sorry, I'm going to to give an example, a concrete example using XOR as sort of a, a sample case, and then I'm going to generalize it and turn that into code that does this completely automatically. Um, and the um, and the idea, as conventionally presented, and I think this is a good place to start, is to look at truth tables. So a truth table is um, a table that specifies for every combination of inputs what is the corresponding output. So um, I'm going to use this notation here. Um, and so uh, th this is just literally how XOR is defined. You can, I mean, you can define it in different ways, but um, if you want to specify it as a truth table, which is a complete and unambiguous description of its behavior, this is how you do it. Um, and I'm going to use the lexicographic ordering. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let's go full ASCII art on this. So uh, this is a truth table. And hopefully it's self-explanatory. It says that if x and y are zero, then the xor is zero. If x is zero, y is zero, or y is one, then xor, and so on, and so on. So um, because there are two input bits, there are two to the two possible. Um, two to the two is four, right? There's two, two to the two equals four possible combinations of input bits. Um, and so if you have a single bit output, that um, that you know, this is a complete specification. If you had more output bits, you would just specify a list of them or something like that for for uh, for each of, of of these input combinations. But anyway, um, the way you transform this into this kind of circuit here um, is called the sum of products representation. And the idea is um, for every row where the output bit is one, so that would be here and here. You uh, you write an AND term corresponding to that possibility, and um, if an input bit has to be zero for that uh, for that row, then you write not that variable. So in this case here, uh, for this row, x has to be zero, which means we write not x, and y has to be one, which means we just write y without an inversion. And then for th for this row here, uh, x has to be one, so we write positive x, and uh, y has to be zero, which means we y write uh, not y, uh, and that's it. And then you join these together with boolean or, and this is essentially just an exhaustive case analysis. So here's how you can read it: x or of x and y is one if and only if one of the following possibilities is true: either this is true, or this is true. And otherwise, it's zero, right? That's really what we're doing. This is just a case analysis over the cases where it can be one. Um, and it so happens that um, actually these possibilities are mutually exclusive. Uh, it's not possible for two rows to be simultaneously true. And so you could actually have used XOR. I mean, the small note, but uh, the the rows are mutually exclusive. Um, but but either way, um, this is a case analysis of the cases that yield a result of one. And so you, uh, you you generate a product corresponding to each uh, each true row uh, according to this formula I just gave you, uh, and then you or together all of those uh, product terms corresponding to the true rows. Um, and so you can probably imagine how you could um, implement this in general. Um, and so. Let's let's do that. Um, let's so so what we want to do is we want to somehow take a truth table and we can talk about different ways the truth table can be represented in Python. 
But um, uh, one thing we could do is we could say that we want to have a set corresponding to, well, actually, let's do this. Let's use a black box function. Say someone gives you a function f in Python, and it has to be um, like a normal Python function that operates on, say, booleans or numbers or something like that. Um, and it has some number of inputs. So in the case of something having two inputs, this is what you would do. And so you can feed it, um, you can feed it different combinations of ones and zeros. And for each of those combinations, it will give it some output. And so from that, you get a truth table. Um, and then you find all the rows or all those uh, values that, that correspond to one. And you, you do this kind of sum of products representation. So um, let me show you how that might work. Um, I'm going to define a function called tabulate. Um, and tabulate takes a function and it takes uh, an integer n, which is the number of arguments. In theory, you could extract that by some low level Python tricks, but um, let's say we specify it. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to let's see what the easiest way to do this. Uh, we're going to basically build a, a dictionary that corresponds to this kind of truth table. So uh, in this case here, the dictionary would basically be um, would be something like this. Or, um, well, actually, let's use a set. The, the, it's easier. Since we only care about the terms that are true, let's just use a set. So we're just going to define a set um, containing all the tuples that correspond to true outputs. So this would be here. So we want to build this dictionary of input combinations that yield true outputs. Um, and we want to do this from a black box function. Or actually, let's not even go there first. Let's, let's say we've already built uh, the set of these things and we want to generate the circuit from that. That's easier. And then we'll go back and, and fill, fill in the second step. So uh, I'll call it a truth table, uh, or let's call it a truth set to, uh, to circuit. Um, or just let, let's call it table to circuit maybe. And um, let's see, what do we need to do? Um, um, for um, for row and table, this represents positive rows. You want to um, um, for each entry in that row. Let's see. Um, We also have to pass in the operand, which is going to be a, a signal that the module provides. And so this is going to be some bit vector, a vector of bits corresponding to, or I guess it could just be actually multiple bits. That would be fine too. Um, so we're going to enumerate the row and um, Um, there's two possibilities. If the cell value is, which corresponds to a, you know, an input value, um, this is called X. Um, if that is true, then we want to have the positive version of the operand. Uh, otherwise, we want the negative version. Um, and I'll call this min term um, because that's what this stuff is usually called. The product terms are usually called min terms. Maybe I'll talk about why that is later, but it's because uh, product or and corresponds to the numerical minimum of the two values interpreted as numbers rather than logical, uh, you know, true false. Um, and max terms are then the, pro the sum terms. But um, so so what we're doing here, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain what this function does. This really just takes the and of a bunch of different terms. 
Um, but this here chooses for each uh, of the cells in the, you know, if, if this value here is zero, it means we need to have not x. If it's one, it would be, you know, plain x. And so that's the idea. Um, and um, actually, we can write this very tightly as follows. We want to take um, the or of all these product terms. And so we do something like this. Um, we haven't defined these reduce things, um, but I will show you in a sec. And by the way, the reason, like, already we're doing stuff that if you're talking about conventional um, so-called hardware description languages, which is what this is, it's a way of describing hardware circuits uh, with uh, sort of a, a notation and uh, a mechanism for, for specifying things efficiently, more so than just, like, listing things totally uh, brute force. Uh, one of the great things is, especially if you have a language like Python, is that you can do kind of real programming to generate the circuits. So Python code is not executing, you know, when the circuit is running and being simulated or whatever, right? But it's being, it's running to instantiate uh, a specific circuit. So in this case, um, based on a truth table, uh, we will generate the circuit based on that. That's really what this is doing. Um, let me uh, specify um, this function reduce or. Um, it, it takes a list of operands, uh, as does this. Uh, there's a better way of doing this, but for now I'm going to do do it the naive way. Um, actually, let's just do it. Let's just use the built-in Python function for that. I think we can do that just to show that you can use standard Python tools. Um, you can use standard Python tools. Uh, I believe that's what it's called. Let me just check. Let's take the argument order. Function sequence, right? So if you're familiar with reduce, um, it basically it takes a, an iterable, it takes a you know a list of things, for example, and it takes an operator and it essentially puts that operator between each of the terms. Um, so for example, if you wanted to, if you wanted to compute the sum um, if you wanted to compute the sum of, of a bunch of things, you could do it by doing you could do it by doing this. This puts a plus between each of the elements in this iterable sequence. Uh, in our case, we are just going to put a an OR gate and an AND gate between each of the terms in the sequence, which uh, Unlike you know what you might think of as being the normal behavior in or an AND if you're a Python programmer or a normal programmer, in our case it's actually instantiating gates corresponding to or an AND. But um, uh, anyway, so so this would just be uh, this, and this would be would be this. Um, before we we do this whole thing here, um, let's actually um, try a test case of reduce and whatnot. Um, say we have, uh, first let's try two bits. And say we do reduce or, and then we specify, you know, the list of, of those inputs. Let's see if that does what you hope it does. Right, so you can see it does, it, uh, joins these two inputs with a single OR. Um, and now if you, uh, when you have three inputs, you have a list of three things, it should now cascade. Um, okay, that's incorrect. I guess it's because, okay, well, this gives us an opportunity to implement it ourselves, so that's some time. I guess the, the base behavior, uh, Oh no, that's correct. I just had a typo. Right, so you can see here, it just cascades these and it does it in a linear chain. So if you had 
a very long chain, or if you had a lot of inputs, you would have a very long serial chain of these OR gates. And that's why this specific version of, uh, of reduction is not used in practice. Typically, you want to use a balanced binary tree to reduce the delay. Um, and that we can maybe get to that today. But um, for now, let's just use this serial chaining approach for reduction. Um, and same thing if we did AND. Uh, we could do this, and indeed you could do, you know, you can call this directly with any operator. You can do XOR or whatever. Um, so now let's see if this thing works. Um, suppose um, suppose I uh, call table to circuit, and I now have to specify a table. And remember, it's actually a set. Um, uh, so I'm going to say it's uh, the combinations, again, that yield uh, true outputs. It's going to be this, right, for X, uh, if you wanted to implement an XOR. And um, as operands, uh, we, don't, we only have two. I'm going to specify these. And lo and behold, it is exactly the XOR circuit that we not so painstakingly, but nevertheless manually specified here. Um, now we uh, we uh, we have this. Um, now um, let's do the next step. Let's do the next step. Uh, that was what I tried to start with, but it, I think it was better to start this way. So now we can go from a set to um, uh, we can go from a set. Of, of you know what corresponds to the true rows to a circuit, the so-called sum of product circuit, sum of products. I should mention this. In, in, in Boolean algebra, sum is or and product is and. Uh, I think I just took that for granted that that was clear, but that is maybe not clear if you haven't seen this before. But so sum of products really means or of ands, right? Sum of products or of ands, but uh, it's good to, good to know the, these terms if you come across them. Um, all right, so let's say now, someone gives you um, a black box function. And you know that it's a Boolean function, right? It has takes a set of, of Boolean inputs and produces a single Boolean output, a single bit output. Um, uh, but it's not presented in this explicit form, like it's just a Python function. So for example, um, if I take, you know, if I take something like this and I feed in, um, you know, if, if I feed in, let's just uh, do it here. Um, so suppose I just, uh, I, I call this function for all possible inputs. Um, I can actually build up the table that corresponds to that. So even if someone gives me a black box function like this, I can easily build up the table corresponding to the sort of thing you want to feed in here. You see what I, do, do, do you see what I mean? And so it would be nice to, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a function called tabulate, which is what I tried to start with, which basically would, would take something like XOR, uh, and basically it would do the equivalent of this uh, to build up the set of things, uh, but it does it for a, you know, a variable, uh, a variable thing, like a, it can have more than two arguments. It can have 10 arguments, something like that. Um, and so let's see. Um, um, this is probably not the most efficient way to do it. Maybe we can exploit some built-in Python functions to enumerate the power set. Um, or we can write it ourselves. It's probably in iter tools if it's there. Um, yeah, here. Um, Just verify my understanding of that function. Um, 
if I do iter tools product uh, zero one and I say repeat right, let's not do ten, let's do four. So that should be sixteen different combinations. All oh, right, it has to be a let's do it like that. Well, actually, there's an easier way to do it, I suppose. Um, you can do. use multiplication of a list Oh, I see. Right. So you can see that this this is all the Cartesian products. It's all the combination of zero and one inputs uh, when you have four arguments. So that's probably one of one of the easier ways to do it. Um, and so uh, tabulate. Did I start writing that? Tabulate is going to um, uh, four args in iter tools product, uh, and actually I'm I'm going to import it, but call it like Cartesian product. Can't remember if this is the notation I use that so rarely. Um, take the Cartesian product of um, n times zero and one so let's just test that first so if I do uh, like two we can see we get all those input possibilities. So then all we have to do is we have to call f. Um, and uh, if we get a true value, then we uh, we add that combination of arguments to the table. So if I do this, I should get back right exactly those two combinations of inputs that yield a true output. Um, and then. Um, down here you can then define a function called function to circuit and actually let's uh, rather than specifying n um, or rather let's say n is optional um, and if it is if it's not specified then we try to get it from I can't remember if there's an easy way to uh, how, how easy it is to get that but I, I'm assuming it's probably not too bad so suppose you have a function uh, like this and um, let's see what fields are here. Um, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, I mean, let me try to break my habit of of, <laughs> of using single variable 
single letter variable names. Um, for, for things like this, uh, there's no information you could convey by calling them anything other than X and Y or something like that. But for other things, let's try to be a little bit better. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is tabulate. And so I'm going to find a fu called function to circuit, which takes a func and a set of operands to connect things to. And all it really does is at first it calls table to circuit and, um, and it tabulates the function. And then it just uses that. So this is really all it does. Now um, let's try to do this. Um, with function to circuit. And in fact, I'm going to just use a lambda so we don't even need to, you know, just use an anonymous function. Um, let's see if that works. At least it didn't complain. And we still have this thing here. Let me just verify that this behaves reasonably. So let's try to apply this to just a plain and function, um, which actually, well, let's, let's so, so, so look at this. Even in the case where we give it a trivial thing, it still gives the minimal representation because, I mean, it's not surprising if you think about it. The same is also true um, for this. No, actually, I guess that's not true. Sorry, that's, yeah, that's correct. It doesn't use uh, a root. Because it, um, that's one thing that's inefficient about this representation. Because it enumerates all possibilities, it doesn't reduce the cases where it doesn't care about a given variable. Um, so this is not a minimum. Um, you know, the, the minimum representation. Let, let me show you what it's doing here, just so this is, a, I think, probably a good example of, of why this kind of approach. Um, is not necessarily what you want uh, always and maybe we can make the modification to reduce that redundancy but basically it tries to do an exhaustive enumeration of or according to a formula so um, it, it followed the recipe correctly it's just that the recipe is not um, so let's see here uh, So the recipe in this case is to add a product term for every one of these true rows. And so it does uh, not x and y and uh, x and not y um, and x and x. Oops. And then it joins those together with or. And I think if you look at what's going on, that's presumably what it does. You can see there's uh, three ands and two ors to join them together. And so that's what it's doing. It's following that recipe to a T, but really what it kind of should have noticed in some sense is that um, some of the arguments va values don't actually matter. Like as long as, if, if X is one, it doesn't matter what Y is. But anyway, it follows the recipe, it's just not foolproof. But if, if you're just interested in establishing universality, then the fact that this is not, uh, you know, you would rather write this as, as this, um, you know, that's this is a much more efficient representation, um, both in delay and in sort of number of components or area, whatever metric you want to use. But nevertheless, it's this is correct. It's just um, more wasteful than necessary. Um, okay, so uh, so you can see it works for that. Let's go back to XOR and let me show you where this maybe gets more interesting. Um, this is a classic um, a classic example of why some of products representation uh, is not very good, doesn't scale. Um, but some of products representations for some logic functions are really good, and they're good when they're sparse. If you have a bunch of inputs. The worst case number of terms is exponential in the number of inputs because you can have every combination of true and false. Uh, like, for example, if uh, an, an XOR is actually exactly the case for that, 
uh, if exactly half, well, The way I wrote the code is actually really bad in the case where you have, for example, something that's always true. It's going to add a bunch of, of terms that ultimately don't contribute anything. But even if you eliminate those sorts of terms, you remove all the needless uh, stuff like that. In the case where exactly half of the rows are true, um, and there's no easy pattern to factoring out those cases, like that's the case with XOR, um, it turns out there's an exponential number of terms, product terms, um, uh, so it's a huge formula. If you want to, if you want to uh, XOR together with, with this kind of sum of products representation, if you want to XOR together eight different input bits, the sum of products representation has on the order of, I guess, 128 or something like that product terms. So um, uh, let me show you that. This is where maybe enumerating things manually um, wouldn't be very fun. Um, Actually, uh, let me let me do this so we can easily um, let's first verify that this works. This is just a multi Oh, I guess it needs to know the number of arguments. So I'm sorry, we can't do that. Um, but anyway, let's do a three argument version of this. Um, three argument XOR. Then we need another input. And you can see there are a bunch more terms. One, two, three, or sorry. Uh, one, two, so so there's three ors, which means there's uh, four terms, um, which is half of eight. Now, if I uh, if I do this, there should be eight. Or seven, I guess, of uh, these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which means there's eight terms, which is half of 16. Um, and anyway, so it turns out that this circuit, um, if you want to try to XOR a bunch of bits together with a two, so called two level circuit, meaning some, uh, there's products and then there's some, that's a two level circuit, two levels of, of, of logic. Um, although, if you it's sort of a misnomer in some sense. If you're using binary gates like this to represent it, it's not really two level. But if you imagine that you have a an AND gate that can take an arbitrary number of inputs and an OR gate that can take an arbitrary number of inputs, then it's two levels because you have the ANDs for the products and then the ORs for the sums. Um, but anyway, uh, for this kind of two level circuit, it turns out that this is basically the best you can do. So the fact that things are exploding in this exponential fashion as we add more inputs uh, getting this exponentially growing number of terms. That's not an artifact of, of us being stupid and how we construct the circuit. Uh, as long as you're trying to construct a two-level circuit, some of product circuit, um, that's bound to happen. That's kind of a classic. Uh, I think Shannon proved that. That's a, a classic. Maybe he didn't. I can't remember who proved that lower bound. But that's a classic sort of theoretical computer science thing. Um, but anyway, the, the point is to say don't use this kind of two-level representation uh, uh, needlessly, like you have to, you can only really use it efficiently when things are very sparse. There's not many terms relative to the number of inputs. But um, in any case, this establishes universality. This establishes that any Boolean function can be uh, represented with and, or, and not. Not only did we sort of prove that informally by this sort of truth table tabulation, but we actually wrote code that will, you know, do it for us. And um, even though this is fairly trivial as far as logic design goes, uh, I think this is a good example of how we will leverage like kind of real programming techniques to efficiently express the sort of thing that you would normally uh, in textbooks show with examples, but not really formalize. And uh, I hope hopefully this shows that you can formalize it, uh, automate it um, very efficiently in a usable way. So you know at this point you can basically you know, you can feed in any black box function. It discovers the, tr the truth table. 
and it generates the the sum of product circuit for it. Um, how are we doing on time? We've been going about an hour and a half. Let's see what the questions are. And uh, there's plenty more I can cover today. Uh, in fact, I might want to show you a different way of representing Boolean functions called uh, Shannon expansion using multiplexers instead of uh, and or gates. Um, so let's see if people are saying anything. All right. Um, does everything make sense so far? Um, I, I guess sort of as a trend for the series, I'm always going to assume that people are kind of comfortable with programming. So again, it's like it's 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 hardware stuff for people who are very fluent programmers. Uh, you know, in, in the earlier parts of the course, I assume people were fluent in C and systems programming at that level. Um, here, I'm going to assume that this kind this is a very different style of programming we're doing in Python. This is more like how people program in functional languages typically. Um, but that turns out to be a very well adapted style for doing this kind of hardware stuff. Um, but yeah, um, hopefully that makes sense. Let's see. Maybe I'll call this set to circuit, which is accurate. Um, the table suggests that it's a dictionary. And let's call it table. All right. Um, Alrighty. Um, okay, maybe let me cover um, let me cover multiplexers, and then I'll cover a similar kind of universality uh, uh, result for using multiplexers, which uh, is actually more important in practice. Um, I would say um, it's especially when you're doing FPGA stuff. It's typically what you do, but also just in general. Uh, and for some reason. It's not, I mean, it is covered in textbooks, but it, it seems to be less well known to beginners. So uh, let me cover uh, first multiplexers, which are well known, and then Shannon, Shannon expansion for, uh, for representing Boolean functions uh, as an alternative. It's a multi-level representation. It's an alternative to something like this. All right. Um, the, um, so, uh, so far we were emphasizing, you know, uh, and or and not gates as building blocks. We did use XOR in a few places, but we also showed how we can build XOR ourselves out of those building blocks. Um, another another primitive that's very important um, is a multiplexer. Um, and uh, the idea behind a multiplexer is that it's a circuit equivalent of an if expression. Um, and there's a in Rattle there's a built-in way of doing this is a, a so-called two to one uh, a, a two to one multiplexer, uh, which is the when node. So um, let me uh, let me just show a simple um, simple example here. Um, so, so say we have three inputs, and we have an output, and um, the way you write it is using this when function to construct it. And so this acts much like, you know, if you're writing in C, the, the offhand order is a little bit different with Python if expression, so I'm not going to use that as an example. But if you're writing an if expression in C, a so-called ternary conditional, you would write it like this, which means, you know, if X is true, then the result of this expression is Y, else it's C, right? So this is a, like an if expression or a ternary conditional. Um, the way you write that in... Um, and rattle is as follows, uh, and maybe I'll give these more descriptive names. Um, like this is um, 
or I'll, I'll call this like D1, I guess, D1, D0, and cont, uh, something like that, or data1, data0, and cont. Uh, maybe I'll call this out just to have longer names for this stuff. So when the condition is true, then you want the result of that node to be data1, otherwise data0. So let me show you just, I mean, it, it, it will look exactly like how it's written, but just to show you, and then we'll move from there. Um, so you can see this uh, this looks like a sub-module, but it's a built-in node and uh, has three inputs. There's the condition, which has to be single bit. Then there are, um, there's two data arguments, data operands, and uh, it switches between them based on the value. So if cont is zero, you get data. You get the else value. Otherwise, you get the then value, um, and that's the idea. Um, just like with you know something like an if expression in a normal programming language, the condition is interpreted as a boolean, meaning it has a zero or one value. But the data operands can be any type, so they can be single bit, they can be multi bit, they can be anything, um, and that's part of what makes them so useful is that you can have a single bit that selects what to do for a bunch of other bits, um, which, which is a very common occurrence. Like you have a single bit control signal that basically routes, based on its value, uh, a whole slew of other signals. Um, but anyway, so that's a multiplexer. Um, just to show that this is not a magical primitive, uh, let, me <laughs> let me show you. Um, Since we have this thing now, I, this was totally unplanned. It non, it's not scripted. Um, uh, let's say eh, don't know what to call them. D zero. Um, D one cell. Th these are s sort of standard names for these. I think fairly standard names for. Um, um, something, yeah, I guess cell. So like data, data zero, data one, and then selector, se uh, sele or selection signal. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use function to circuit just to show you how it can be implemented with gates, uh, with, with and or not gates. Um, and it's going to be as follows. Um, y if x lc so here we're just using python's conditional expression um, and uh, so x is cell and then so the thing that is it true is something like this so if you wanted to implement a multiplexer naively in terms of gates using sum of products this is what you would get um, it's not very pretty. Uh, you can. Why are there three terms? I guess it's just because the way we tabulate is is so brute force. Um, so 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 unless we made a mistake, this works. I will sh I will show you. Um, I will show you. Uh, I guess a more compact way of doing it, um, which is as follows. Uh, if cell is uh, if cell is true, then you want to have um, d1. Otherwise, if cell is false, you want to have d0. Um, I always parenthesize this. I can never remember what the precedence is in Python. A bit wise. So anyway, this is this is the the much more efficient representation. So you could do this, but um, yeah. We should probably return to this uh, another day to show you how to eliminate those redundant terms from some of product stuff. It's it, it's not very difficult. Um, any anytime tr two true rows have all possible values, like have 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 the ha have the same one, zero, have both a zero and a one for a given thing where everything else is equal, then you can just completely remove that variable. Um, but anyway, th this is the more comp com compact expression.
Um, this is again a case analysis. There's two cases, either cell is true or cell is false. If cell is true, then this gives the right thing because if cell is false, this basically suppresses D1, right? If cell is zero, then ending with zero just kills this term uh, and this is complementary. Uh, if this is zero, then not cell is one and so blah, blah, blah. So anyway, th that's, that's how you normally write it. Um, if you want to write it as a node, but again, um, you should use built-ins. Um, because there's nothing magical about booleans being primitives and in fact by trying to prematurely express everything in terms of the basic boolean gates uh, you make every you make everything harder uh, you don't want to do that uh, if you want to do that sort of thing you want to do it as a very last step in, in case you're building your circuit out of those gates you want to do it at the end not at the beginning it's easier to keep things um, re retain the intention of the programmer like this is a win this is a win uh, is a mux, right? Like, uh, keep that intention throughout the process and only at the end translate it to something prim more primitive if you need to. Anyway, so uh, uh, this is just to demonstrate the basic concept of, of how when works. Like, it's like an if condition, if conditional expression. Um, let me show you how to um, do what we did with. Um, with some of products, but using multiplexers and multi-level logic instead. Um, so I believe this is called Shannon expansion, or maybe bool expansion. Yeah. So this is basically what it's saying is: so f is a function of some number of bits, and um, it basically says it's a case analysis, just like a multiplexer itself. It's a case analysis. Um, it says uh, there's two possible values for the first argument, which is x1. Either x is 0 or x is 1. And depending on those cases, you have you just rec you just instantiate the function for those arguments, and you make the that uh, value conditional on x being the right value. So what we wrote here is basically just a mux. Um, like if you look if you look at what this right hand side is, it's exactly a mux the the thing we wrote down here. So uh, if you wanted to write this sort of in R notation, you would write, for example, um, you would write something like this. You would say when x one that means that when x one is um, is true and it's one, then you you can fill in one of the arguments with a constant um, and and then evaluate the remainder. If it's false, then you do this. Um, so, so that's the basic recursive expansion. And this bottoms out once you have a function of, you know, like a, a single argument, I suppose. Um, in which case, you just return the function value directly. No, actually, that's not true. When all the when all the arguments when there's no arguments left, then everything has been filled in, and you're down to a constant, and then you're just muxing between two constants corresponding to a specific combination of input values. And so you can see, for example, if uh, just to show you how it works, if you have uh, two arguments, then at the first level, uh, it looks like this, uh, and then if you repeat this formula at the second level, um, it becomes this for the second branch it becomes this and th so this is just the two level version but you can see how by nesting these muxes uh, and bottoming out in constants uh, you can uh, you get this so-called I guess bool or shannon expansion and so that's a multi-level logic expansion um, and of course you don't have to bottom out all the way you can you can do this multiplexing on a couple of the arguments, and then maybe if the remainder has a nicer representation that doesn't involve nested multiplexers, you go directly to that representation. But um, in any case, this is a universality theorem, um, and it's multi-level rather than two-level, but um, this is often, like especially when you're doing FPGA design, um, like I said, you have a, a, a lookup table as a primitive, and typically it has six inputs, if you want to build a lookup table with seven inputs, 
uh, out of lookup tables with six inputs, the way you do that is you, you, you basically, you do this thing, you mux on the first bit, the seventh bit, leaving six remaining bits, and then you have two LUTs corresponding to essentially uh, this here and this here, and then you have a mux driven by a, another LUT, uh, so a LUT acting as a mux that muxes between those two subtables. So this kind of thing is very common, especially in FPGA design, so it's not only a theoretical result, it's very important in practice. Um, so uh, anyway, let me, uh, let me show you how we can um, do that uh, in sort of a, a similar way to here. Um, I think in this case, um, maybe I'll rename this just to emphasize. Um, all right. Um, all right. All right. All right. So, so what do we have to do? Um, let me think here. I think you want to. Um, I mean, let's just call it that, or a function to muxes, or something like that. Um, so we start with something as before. Um, and I think what you do is we're probably going to define a helper function. Um, maybe I'll call it expand. And it's going to take a function of its own, which is not necessarily going to be the top level function. Um, and I guess it's also going to have numargs. Um, and let's see. When you're down to no arguments, then I think you just call the function and you get back a single constant, which is zero or one. Uh, otherwise, you um, you have to mux between let's see, is that what we called it? Um, yeah. So you have to mux between a bunch of operands, and um, and it's the first operand. Um, it's the first operand we're muxing between. So if that is if that is one, then we want to recursively expand. Um, basically, the function, but now filling in the first argument is one. And otherwise, just passing the remaining arguments, um, and we want to um, pass down the remaining arguments. And decrement. Let's let's pull this out um, because this is. Um, Okay. So something like this. 
and then for the top level, we simply um, call it like that. We just read through this. So if we're if we're if so we keep we reducing the number of arguments by filling them in and building a new function around it as a wrapper. Uh, so this is these are closures, of course. Um, when we're down to zero arguments, we can just call it directly. So it's just a uh, it's just a constant at that point, but but wrapped up as a function. Otherwise, we do the case analysis. Um, if the first argument is true, then we recursively expand it, uh, filling in that true value, and we similarly a false, and then um, I mean you could you can do this, which is maybe. writing it that way. Um, all right. Let's try an example here. Um, Let's do really basic stuff. Let's start with like AND gates and stuff like that, because now we're not using, like note that in none of this are we actually using other gates. The only thing we're using is muxing and constants that are zero or one at the leaves. Everything else we're doing uh, is just muxing. So, so muxing, if you have constants and you have muxes, then you can do anything. Muxes being multiplexers like this one node. Um, and I should also mention, well, the, 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 we're using a special kind of mux here called the two to one mux. If you ever hear me say mux, it means two to one mux without, if I'm not specifying anything for, further. You can build wider muxes exactly with this result by just nesting muxes that dispatch on progressively more specific bits. Um, anyway, so let's say function to muxes. Um, let's say we have just a plain AND gate and the operands are i1 and i2. Let's see if that works. All right. Doesn't mean that it worked, worked, but it didn't complain at least. Oh, sample three. All right. That looks correct at least. So uh, l let's look at what this is doing. It, it's arbitrarily, like one thing that this kind of pool expansion does is it treats the arguments differently. And so depending on how you order the arguments, you can get a very different formula. That's quite unlike some of products, which is inherently, it doesn't really treat the, the variables differently. But when you do this kind of muxing, it's quite important which one you dispatch on first. Uh, not so much in this example, but it, later on, if we'll look at kind of things like binary decision diagrams and so on, um, those are essentially mux trees of this sort, and it turns out to be very important what order you mux in. Uh, you can have massive differences in the circuit size. But anyway, um, so you can see what it does here at the. Let's look at the. Let's look at the leaves first. I was blocking something on, with my hand on the screen, which you obviously can't see. If you look at the stuff uh, that is directly driven by I2, you can see that if I2 is true, then the output of this thing is true. Otherwise, it's false. Um, And in this other case, it's false no matter what. So this is really just zero. So that's an example of something you could easily simplify if you were optimizing. Like this whole thing here could be optimized to a zero because you can see regardless of what I2 is, we always get zero as the output. So this is just a naive expansion that doesn't try to optimize away any trivial applications of muxes. Um, but you can see basically what it says is the following. Um, if I write out what the logic is, it says that this is equivalent. Uh, this is equivalent to, um, you know, if I if in order for the output to be true, what what has to, well. It's like this, right? Um, basically, 
if I1 is true, then I all then I2 also has to be true for the output to be true. If any other case happens, it has to be zero. So one way of thinking about this is that it's really just a hierarchical truth table where rather than flattening everything out into rows, you sort of have a truth tree or something like that. But anyway, so that's it for um, for two level, but now let's try something like XOR, like the multi-input XOR, which exploded before. If you remember, this might still be pretty big, um, but it shouldn't be exponential size at least. Actually, I guess it is, right? If we're not simplifying any further, this is uh, this is actually exponential size without any further. I mean, which is not. It it can be simplified more, but but anyway, let me. The, I mean, okay, so, so so let me just make an obvious observation here. The the mux things we're constructing here are also going to be exponential in size relative to the number of inputs because we recurse down two branches and then we combine them. And so it grows by a factor of two at every step because you branch in two directions at every step. And so that's two to the n uh, levels of recursion. Or not levels, there's two to the n recursions or the two, to n, two to the n leaves basically. Um, but well, yeah, let's look at the corresponding thing here. Um, X, Y, C, W. Um, but uh, the, uh, so is that right? One, two. Oh, this is pretty neat. Ah, uh, it means I have to explain some stuff. It's because I have basically implicit BDDs in uh, in my memorization. So you should be a little one, two, three. Like, do you see how the output of this is used in two different places? And so let, let, let me remove the memorization. For a second. It's it's purely an optimization, but it's pretty important. Okay, I have to rerun. Circuit generator. Okay, this is what the full exponential size circuit looks like. And you can see that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's eight leaf nodes corresponding. Um, you know, and each of those has two inputs, which are the the true leaves. So here's there's six there's uh, sixteen here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So this is exponential size. Uh, but note that that didn't happen before. Uh, and the observation basically is that a bunch of these nodes are the same. Let's see if I can show you how. Um, look at this. See what I'm showing with the cursor. Look at this node here and look at this node here or this node here. Do you see that they are the same? They have the same inputs. The cont is I4 and the constant inputs are the same, 0 and 1 in that order. And similarly, this thing here is the same as this thing here. And so. You can memorize it. You can detect very easily just with, that's what this memo functor does. You can detect that you're trying to instantiate the exact same thing twice. And you can just, rather than creating a new independent node, you can just fan out the existing node to one more, uh, you know, one more endpoint. Um, and that turns out to be a really smart idea for a lot of circuits when you're building these MUX networks. And, um, the fancy name for that is like, I mean, the, 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 basically the kind of mux tree where you try, where you, where you share nodes in a certain reduced way is called a reduced binary decision diagram. Um, and I, I wasn't planning to cover that formally uh, for quite a while, but you can go and read this if you're interested. It turns out that the way we, the way I set up Rattle, we get it for free, literally just by this one line by memorizing 
um, by memorizing the constructor and constructor functions for building muxes. Um, and so you could see that the original thing unmemorized is exponential size, but it turns out that a lot of natural circuits have really compact BDD representations because there's a lot of reusability in those nodes, uh, and that's what you get here. And so in fact, this is not exponential size. You can see it's, um, it looks like, well, let's make it bigger, but it looks like it's 2n. There's 2n muxes, right? Like one, two, three, four. It's four deep, of course, and then it's uh, there's only two nodes at any level. Like, let's see how it scales. Maybe it's quadratic size or something like that. Um, let's add one more bit. Um, let's use part of the alphabet we're not running out of. Yeah, so you can see it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's, what was it? Uh, there's one at the top, and then there's two at every level below that, and then there's the leaves. Uh, and by the way, the bottom level can usually be optimized out to some simpler thing if you want to use other gates. But anyway, uh, I wasn't planning on talking about that, but one consequence of doing this sort of thing is indeed that if you memorize the constructors for uh, multiplexers, uh, you get these so-called reduced binary decision diagrams, which are very compact representations, compact in terms of circuit size of a lot of natural circuits, including something like XOR, uh, but also more th complex things, which I guess we'll cover later. And they have all kinds of wonderful applications. Like for example, it turns out to be a canonical representation of a function. So if someone gives you a black box function and asks you, uh, like represented by a diagram, uh, you can check, there's a simple, you can do a simple direct equality check between two diagrams if the inputs are in the same order because there's a, it's a canonical representation that turns out. Um, I mean, a truth table is a canonical representation too, but it's extremely large. But it, this is a often compact canonical representation, so you can do what's called equivalence checking. For example, if you have a naive implementation of a, of a function, like an adder is the classic example, and you have a fast implementation using fancy tricks, you can formally verify that they're identical by uh, basically, by, well, actually you can do various things, uh, but uh, you can do a direct uh, direct isomorphism check on, the, uh, on this kind of diagram. Um, so even though they look very different in the specification when you represent them as BDDs, they turn out to have a compact canonical representation that you can directly check for equality. Um, so that's a classic application of BDDs in formal verification of circuits. Um, but anyway, I think we've gone for two hours now, and I didn't even realize we would hit this. This was sort of an emergent uh, property of some stuff, um, but it's pretty cool, I think. So what did we cover? Talked a little bit about um, rat rattle basics, how to specify modules, the different operators. Tried to emphasize... The fact that, you know, while it's pretty natural to work with these Boolean operators uh, like and or not, as the primitives, they're not necessarily the, the reality of, of what is the right set of primitives in any given situation, uh, and that given one set of primitives, you can construct another set of primitives out of them. Um, proved universality of those basic Boolean operators um, with a sum of products representation showed some cool Python tricks for how you can take a black box function, tabulate it, and then turn it into a sum of products representation. Um, showed some examples of how sum of products can blow up for things like this so-called parity function, which is the multi-input, multi-bit XOR function. Um, then talked about muxes, showed how muxes can be represented with you know conventional Boolean gates, but also can be treated as a primitive in their own right. And if you do that, then um, you can do this bool Shannon expansion to represent any Boolean function, not as a two-level sum of products, but as a tree of muxes. Um, and we, we, we discovered um, as an emergent property of the fact that muxes are memorized in rattle, um, certain functions that would otherwise have exponential blow up actually turn out to have a very compact linear size, like the parity circuit that blew up for sum of products has a very compact representation here because of the memorization. Um, but, you know, it's a multi-level representation, but in reality, the multi-levelness, uh, like, two-level logic is sort of a misnomer in practice, 
Um, it can be faster than multi-level, but often you end up, when, when you have a lot of inputs for so-called two-level logic, you end up having to use various trees to reduce it anyway, and it ends up being logarithmic depth rather than two-level. So anyway, uh, that's it for today. Uh, we'll continue with this sort of stuff next time, uh, but let me look at questions first before I shut off the stream. All right. Um, uh, someone asked, are, are, are six input bits often utilized? It seems like most things would be less than or equal to three inputs or eight or more inputs, bytes and beyond. Six just seems like an odd number, not even a power of two. Well, six is, I mean, the, the FPGA vendors have tried various um, numbers over time. It used to be four, I think, almost like in the 90s, almost everyone used four. And then it turned out to, that six was a better number. It should also be mentioned that um, both the, the two big vendors, Silinx and Altera, now Intel, um, their six input LUTs can be fractured into a five to two MUX, or sorry, a five to two LUT, so that you can also represent with the same uh, device, uh, you can also represent uh, a function from five input bits to two output bits. Um, as for what they're useful for, um, well, muxes is a good example. Uh, if you want to do a four, so uh, the kind of two to one mux that we covered here has two data bits and one selector bit. If you want to do a four to two, four to one mux, so you want to select between four possible data inputs uh, as the output. That needs two selector bits, and so that's four plus two, that's six. So one four to two mux fits in a LUT. Um, the other thing you can do is any kind of reduction is naturally a, a many to many bit to one bit reduction. So for example, if we wanted to do something like a parity of six bits, that would fit in a single um, a single uh, six LUT. If you wanted to check whether, for example, um, like any reduction tree. Typically, like if you wanted, for example, to check whether two 32-bit integers are the same, um, that is the equivalent to checking that the uh, that the XOR of all the bits, the bitwise XOR of all the bits is zero, and you can do that with a reduction tree, and the bottom of a reduction tree bottoms out in six LUTs that takes six, six inputs and reduces it to a single value that says whether all of those bits are equal. And then the bottom below that has to filter that down to make sure that all the six bit slices are equal to, to produce the final result. So, so that's the that's the answer. And it, and especially, yeah. Anyway, it, the the synthesis compiler that you use um, to compile a bit a bit stream that you can actually deploy directly to an FPGA tries to do a good job of discovering and packing things into LUTs. But uh, as for your question, it turns out a lot of things can actually exploit. Um, can naturally exploit, um, you know, more than two or three inputs. Um, but it's not the end of the world if you can't fill it up completely with inputs, right? Uh, it's just it gives you flexibility, and I think they have empirically validated uh, across a bunch of test cases that it turns out to be a good choice. Anyway, so that's kind of the reason. Uh, plans to implement circuit optimizations uh, algorithms. Uh, maybe some basic stuff. I mean, like even BDDs is a circuit optimization algorithm, and that's the the stuff we have right now is memorization basically. Um, so I, I do a bunch of sort of simple opportunistic things that are basically applying algebraic laws, like um, uh, and other than that, memorization is pretty powerful uh, for things like BDDs. Um, but I mean, maybe we'll do some basic stuff, but my plan is not to go super deep down that rabbit hole because to do really good circuit optimization, you can't really work at this level of abstraction. You really have to have detailed knowledge of the device you're targeting. Um, and that's in my opinion, for at least for my goals with this uh, series, it's better left to the vendor specific tools for now. So I'll cover the stuff that's more universal and high level, but uh, not the really low level vendor specific stuff. And, and pretending that you can do too much at the high level is um, is kind of a mirage. Like, you know, it, it's like when you're up, it's it's like writing a compiler optimizer. There's some stuff that's agnostic with respect to um, with respect to the target or backend, but a lot of things do have to you have to have some knowledge of the backend to do a good job of. Anyway, uh, I think that's it for the questions. Uh, I will be back. I guess this will be Friday. Uh, two days from now.
with the next entry in this and we'll just continue to build up um, from here. But I thought this was a good place to start. It kind of showed some very basic stuff, but also showed how you can use kind of real programming approaches to, to automating things that are normally just kind of sketched out in textbooks with examples and maybe some, you know, some 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 loose math. But um, so hopefully this was pretty cool. All right, I think that's it for today. See everyone next time.